Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. That's more like a DPINGO uh, shout out. <laughs> so I am Howard Diallo. Uh, I manage the uh, NGO relations and liaison work of the Department of Public Information. I'm so happy to welcome you to our, our briefing this uh, cold December morning. I'm really happy that you took the time to come out and to spend some time with us. We have a really great speaker, so I know I'm really excited. How are you feeling? You must be feeling better than that. So uh, I'm just taking the mic, taking advantage right now to uh, make a few announcements and share some uh, juicy stories with you. Uh, Madam uh, um, Espinoza, the uh, PGA, President of the General Assembly, has been called to another meeting. Um, you know, she's quite a dynamic woman. I don't know if you follow her on Twitter. If you don't, make sure that you do. Uh, so she'll be coming around 10, 15, 10, 20. So um, we're going to have to gear ourselves up for this dynamic engagement uh, that will be coming this morning. But since we're waiting, I thought that I would just share some things with you. Uh, my colleagues had some signs up on the board before. Uh, who's going to do their annual review? Need a little bit more hands than that. <laughs> So the annual review finally opened for all those people who were nice enough to send me a lot of emails. <laughs> Here's your response. So the annual review, actually, for those people who don't know, um, it's the way that uh, NGOs that are formally associated with the Department of Public Information uh, report back to us and tell us what they're doing. Because we really do believe it's not just uh, the UN uh, sharing our information. You guys are doing an awesome job out there, right? So we need to know what all the NGOs are doing on the ground within their network. So this is the way that they come back and they talk back to us to tell us what they're doing. And I think we use this information really to, again, to validate the work that you're doing. We share it internally so that people really get a really true meaning and understanding of really what is happening on the ground. So please do your annual review. If you were just recently formally associated with the DPI, you get a pass. You don't have to do it this year. It's only for the old fogies. <laughs> so um, I think we're all waiting for those uh, reports, Felipe especially. <laughs> and the other exciting news um, all the way on the other side there is about the conference. I don't know if you guys know that as of 1 January uh, 2019, the name of this department is going to change. Who knows? Can anybody tell me what the new name is? Press your mic, raise your hand, and uh, help me out. I saw many. Do you know what the new name is going to be? Oh, my young lady there from uh, University of Notre Dame, Baltimore. Press your mic and tell everybody what the new name of the department is going to be. Office of Global Communications. Bring us up, girl. We're more than an office. <laughs> global Communications. It's the Department of Global Communications. So as of 2 January, well, 1st January, um, we will now be called Department of Global Communications. So which means that we have to tweak the name of the conference. So don't be surprised if you start you know, from now uh, seeing us. Uh, well, right now it says here 68th UN DPI NGO Conference, Salt Lake City, August 28, 26. See, I gave you the wrong information. 26, 27, 28. But moving forward, most likely, we're going to be referring to the um, conference, because you guys probably saw the call for the chair of the conference also. Um, so we're calling it the United, 68th United Nations NGO Conference. So um, spread the word. And we're looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, we have the first technical mission, uh, Maher, Nahir, who, uh, Maher Nasser, who will be moderating uh, this uh, uh, morning session um, is our director who led that uh, technical mission. I'm sure he might mention a few things, but I'm sure you guys know also that on 13 December, we have a planning meeting for the conference. So be there or be square. You need to get involved. It's a conference that, organi that is organized not only by our department, but jointly with who? With you guys, with civil society. So please be sure to come on the 13th of December. 
Uh, 13th of December will be the planning meeting for the conference. Uh, I mentioned already, if you subscribe to our newsletter, you would have received already the call for the chair of the conference. So as uh, many people know who are involved in the conference, uh, there's a planning process. That process is led by a civil society chair and a DPI chair. But once the conference starts, the UN pulls back and the chair, civil society, uh, is in charge, full force. So we've put out a call for nominations for that. Oh, here comes my hair now. <laughs> we've put out a call for nominations for that, as well as a call for members to serve as volunteers uh, in the planning committee. I just mentioned that you were in Utah uh, last week, and maybe you might say a couple of things. Uh, we're waiting for the PGA to come. She should be here shortly. It's changed. 10 yes, at 10.20. So I was taking advantage just to give him some announcements that we have on the board yeah. because I like to take the mic also. But uh, I don't know if you have anything to say or do you want to? We'll say it there. Yes. Think, okay. Yeah. So those are the really announcements that we have. We'll um, wait for the PGA. Yes. So um, as we wait for the PGA, if you have any questions, um, we'll be over to the side. Please feel free to uh, come up to us and we'll be happy to help you with, other, with any questions that you have. Thank you.
superb. Good morning. Good morning to all of you in the room and welcome to this session of the DPI briefings, which is a one-on-one -on -one with the Her Excellency President of the General Assembly. Uh, and to all of you following us on webcast, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, I think we're very excited to have this session to conclude the year. I'm not sure whether, I think this is probably the final in the year. My team didn't tell me, but it most likely, actually it's not, there's one next week. <laughs> I stand corrected. Uh, please make sure, as, as always, you know the instructions. I mean, please keep your phones on. Just put it on silent, because we want you also to join in the conversation on social media. The uh, handles are on the screen, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, hashtag DPINGO. And of course, the handle for the PGA is at UN underscore PGA. And mine is, is, is online at Maher Nasser UN. Um, please also, for, uh, for those of you following on webcast, feel free to send us the questions if you have any questions uh, to be able to include you in the discussion. Today, 5 December, is of course also the International Volunteer Day. And on this day, I think the, international, the UN Volunteers Program, they have chosen the theme of resilient communities. And I think it resonates well with the discussion we're having today because I know uh, the President of the General Assembly's theme is also how to bring the UN closer to people and building resilient communities is, is one of that. Today is also World Soil Day. So this is uh, soil. Yeah. So, and, the, and the FAO has chosen the theme of uh, hashtag stop soil pollution because soil pollution is one of the problems that now we are actually encountering with it. So we're very lucky today, and I think uh, we're honored to have with us uh, Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinoza, uh, as you know, is the President of General Assembly and has taken up her position on the 17th of September. The PGA is also the Foreign Minister of Ecuador and has held positions as Minister of National Defense, Coordination Minister of National natural and cultural heritage, and I guess you all know and have noticed that she's the fourth woman to hold the position, and I think the first woman from Latin America, and we hope that she won't be the last. And this lopsided wall of men's photographs on the second floor we'll have more and more women to change it and we reach gender parity in that side as well. So, this is an opportunity for you as representatives of NGO civil society to interact with, of course, the President of General Assembly who presides over the 73rd session and has indicated from the early days of her presidency of wanting to engage with the people and to bring the UN closer to the people, to you. You are representing many NGOs, many communities that are, of course, represented through their governments, but I think also we would like to engage and have you, give you the opportunity to engage with the President to talk to you uh, about her priorities, the theme of the session, and what she hopes to achieve by working with the 193 member states but also with you as civil society. And one of the things that we can also talk about later on is the upcoming civil society conference that will take place in Salt Lake City. We organize a conference every year. As you know, it used to be called DPI NGO Conference. It took place this August here at the UN, but the department's name is being changed to the Department of Global Communications as of 1st of January. And the conference, therefore, next year is going to be called the Civil Society, United Nations Civil Society Conference. The mayor of Salt Lake City uh, came here in August and she offered to host it. So it will be the first time this UN conference will go to a city other than New York. And we hope you will be able to join us, uh, Madam President, uh, to join at least 
expected 5,000 people. The city is planning for 5,000 people. The conference is going to be around the theme of building safe, inclusive, and resilient and sustainable communities together, SDG 11, and how it relates to the other SDGs, especially, of course, looking into the urban communities and, and, and climate change and all of these things happening together. So without further ado, uh, I think maybe uh, we'll turn now to you, Madam President, to tell us more about your priorities and how you see working with civil society representatives and civil society and, and young people. Because also what we have tried to encourage is young and youth participation in these briefings and these conferences. The last conference, we had one third or more than a third of the participants were young people, youth. So uh, this is a great opportunity for also young people. I would like to see more questions from young people today. So uh, if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> and don't try to sit in the back. I'll, I'll pick the ones in the back first. So, Madam President, please. Well, thank you so much, Maher, for um, inviting me, uh, for allowing me to have this dialogue with you today. Um, and uh, when I sit in front of, uh, of people like you that devote your lives uh, to dream, to uh, a struggle to make the dreams come true on different areas, because I assume that you're working on different issues, whether it be disarmament, uh, the environmental agenda, climate, women's rights, um, all, you know, every issue on the multilateral agenda. I, I, I really uh, commend you uh, for devoting your life to that. And um, just just uh, to share with you a personal note, you know, my first job, no, I started at 17. I did, uh, I was very audacious. I, I participated in a, in a public uh, a call uh, to, uh, to work in the National Institute of Heritage. I was 17 years old. I just ended high school. And uh, my father told me, but no, they're not going to give you the job. You're not old enough. Uh, but I did. I applied. Uh, I, uh, just in case I didn't put my, my birth date, just to make sure. And, and I won. I, I started working uh, for the public service very early on. But my, my serious first job uh, was, I think I was 20 years old. I worked for a very small NGO in my country called Fundación Natura. And I, uh, st starting there, I, I started my commitment to the environmental cause, and in particular, uh, environmental cause uh, connected to the rights of indigenous peoples in my country. And here I am, several decades after that, uh, with you. Uh, I'm here with you in a moment where uh, you are, and you and your work are more needed than ever. Because, you know, it is not a secret that we all need to join forces to make sure that multilateralism is taken seriously, that we commit and recommit to the multilateral agenda, and to make sure that we go, um, we look at the future and we build for a, bre a better present and future, uh, and that we are responsible with future generations as well. Sometimes, you know, environments uh, change, sometimes difficulties emerge, and I believe strongly that the voices of civil society, that uh, your, um, the, your role as uh, transiting together with decision making, um, uh, this decision makers in general in different countries is indeed, you know, more needed perhaps uh, than ever. Uh, you are, you know, the, the voice of consciousness of uh, your countries, uh, the voice of, of consciousness, also in a way of society. So I think that um, I, I, I really applaud. I was thinking, to be honest, I thought we were going to have a conversation with 20 NGOs, uh, 
uh, and we will be sitting in circle among us, but now I see a, a full room and that also is a reflection of uh, how much uh, importance and commitment and connection um, civil society has to the work of the United Nations. Uh, I think that, <laughs> thank you. I think that when, when we were um, asked to choose a theme for this year's session, we thought about several you know, options. But I am very happy that we decided to uh, use this phrase, making the UN relevant to all. Uh, and I think that we live in times where we need to make the organization relevant. And how do we make the, the, the organization relevant? People ask me, but how? You know, I wish I had a crystal ball and just have everything clear in my mind. But the truth is that to make the organization more relevant, we need to be more efficient. We need to be more transparent. We need to be able to listen more to the people we represent. We need to have el pie en la tierra, as we say in Spanish. The foot on the, uh, huh? Feet on the ground. It's, yeah, thank you. Feet on the ground. And we really, really, really need to deliver better. And that's why when we were thinking about this, making the U United Nations relevant for all, um, we came up with seven priorities. And it's not that we just came with a list of issues. Uh, we did a serious work identifying what were the most pressing issues. And I did, you know, a broad consultations with regional groups, with political groups, bilateral, uh, bilateral conversations. And we came up uh, with uh, these uh, seven priorities, but they are totally connected with this year's session it, they are connected to the mandates that the General Assembly has, but they are also connected to the needs and expectations of public opinion, of people around the world. And one of them, perhaps, and I, I repeat this, is a priority that is not going to make front pages. It is not very sexy, it's not very, um, you know, uh, I, I'm going to write three articles about this. No but it's very important. I am, the first priority on is on revitalization of the United Nations. It is about making sure that the organization is fit for purpose. It is making sure that the organization really, whatever we do every day of our lives, uh, the bureaucracy within the UN, uh, member states, officials, delegates, we all think about the people in need out there. And believe me that when things get tough here, and th things get tough pretty often nowadays on several issues, I always think, you know, if we take this decision, who are the human beings that are behind this? Who is going to suffer? who is going to have more hope, who is going to be affected by the decisions we take. And believe me that it is a simple yet a very important exercise. I'm, a, I'm just coming back from Katowice yesterday. I don't even know. The day before yesterday. Yeah, the day before yesterday. And I told that in, my, in the opening uh, plenary speech. I said, please to the delegates, to the negotiators. Just think about what is going to happen if you don't agree on a strong program of work for the Paris Agreement. We are all already seeing millions being displaced from their home countries because of climate-related climate, uh, climate related issues. Read the data, read the scientific evidence that we really need to come to grips on this. And in any other issue, on disarmament issue, uh, on peace and security issues, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, perhaps during the conversation we can expand a little more. But basically this revitalization uh, uh, priority has three pillars. One is to support the Secretary General in 
implementing the reform process. One of the uh, outcomes already is the change in the, in the name of the DPI that now is going to be called the Department of Global, Global Communications. But th these are not only name changes, and it's important, uh, Maher, that uh, people know about it. We are undergoing a profound restructure of this organization to deliver better, to be more grounded, to be more effective, more responsive, etc. But, uh, you know, perhaps uh, if you're interested, we, we can talk about that. So reform of the United Nations, the three pillars, the pillar on peace and security, the, the, the pillar on management, and, and the pillar on the new uh, development system. The second component, and please, we need your help on this, it's to boost the process on revitalization of the General Assembly. The General Assembly has to regain its authority. We should not forget that the General Assembly is the Parliament of Humanity, is the most democratic and universal body of the multilateral system. And sometimes we, we face challenges. We face challenges of being able to deliver of being able, I, I call it the, the um, implementation gap that we have. We pass every year 600 uh, resolutions, but then the follow-up, the mainstreaming, the being serious about the things that we put forward are put in question. But we also need a, a structure, uh, a scaffold, a strong scaffold, you know, to support the work of the General Assembly and of the President himself. Uh, there are a lot of issues that we need to resol resolve and, um, and address uh, on, on this particular issue. And the third pillar of the, of the uh, revitalization is uh, the reform of the Security Council. You know very well, if you're familiar with the UN, this is one of the most contentious yet most divisive issues. We will continue with the process in this session, and if you're interested, I can give you perhaps also some information. I will go on very quickly on the other priorities, gender equality, very important, and I will focus in particular on issues of the political empowerment of, on, of women and the political participation of women in decision making. I will be organizing a high level event on the 12th of March, I'm saying it because uh, I think we would love to see you there, uh, uh, called Women in Power to look at uh, the challenges that uh, women face when they have chosen a political career. So we hope to have uh, female heads of state and government uh, being here in New York for the 12th of March. Third priority is on the rights of persons with disabilities, basically two priorities, uh, the uni uh, to universalize uh, the CRPD, the convention, we're working towards that, uh, working also in making the UN and the UN quarters everywhere more accessible to persons with disabilities. Uh, I have created a steering committee that was launched with the full engagement and participation of civil society, a steering committee last week to look at the accessibility uh, part uh, of this building but of the UN offices uh, around the world. Um, the fourth uh, priority, of course, climate action, of course, Climate uh, on the environment, two issues. Climate action, a high-level event uh, on the 28th of 28th of March. I hope I'm saying the I'm saying the right thing. But 28th of March, high-level event on climate and future generations is a mandated event by the General Assembly, and this is going to be like a stepping stone or a moment to prepare for the climate summit in September, and also to take stock from Katowice. Um, climate action, but also something that is extremely important and where civil society has, you know, has a very, very important role to play, which is the global campaign against single-use plastics and plastic pollution. Uh, we launched the campaign with the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda uh, yesterday, and uh, um, your organizations, please, should be 
fully engage uh, with this. There are several ac activities that we are uh, uh, that we have planned, uh, starting by a photo contest on on, on uh, oceans pollutions and, and and plastic pollution in particular. Um, and the campaign will continue uh, this year. We have uh, great support from DPI, and we will continue to partner with with uh, NGOs and civil society to make it a uh, reality. Uh, the other um, priority is on youth peace and security. I won't expand on that, but the approach is a sustaining peace approach, a preventive diplomacy approach, and to put at the center the role of young people as makers and architects of, of peaceful societies. And uh, we have also planned a series of activities. There is a global conference that is very, extremely important in Helsinki, in Finland, uh, in, Jul in March, in March uh, also. And we will have, you know, an echo of that uh, here uh, in New York uh, as well. Uh, which priority I'm leaving out? Ah, decent work, very important. This year is the centenary of the ILO. Uh, there is a very important report that is coming out on the future of work. Since uh, I have, um, you know, uh, um, used the theme of women empowerment and youth, I think that the issue of decent work is extremely important, especially nowadays. This year, the HLPF, ECOSOC, is going to assess uh, the SDG on decent work and economic growth. We will take that momentum, team up with ECOSOC, team up with ILO, and organize a meaningful conversation about the future of work, especially putting young people and putting women at the center. Uh, on the role of women, not only to access of women to quality jobs, but to reduce uh, the gap on the... Um, the salary gap between men and women uh, around the world. I think I've covered them all, okay. Um, just to make sure that I'm not leaving anything out. Okay, so basically this is the work we're doing and, and believe me, the, the umbrella, the, uh, the aloe that pushes us to work hard every day is to make this organization more relevant to all. Just on a quick note. Hmm? Oh, little thing, migration, I forgot. It's because I'm about to travel to Marrakesh, perhaps, that I forgot that. But uh, yes, migration and refugees is indeed uh, the seventh priority. Migration, the global compact on migration. Uh, we really ha want to have a strong conference in Marrakesh. We really want to show that a shared framework for cooperation, for exchange of good practices, for looking at migration as a phenomenon that has uh, determined human history, I think it's uh, necessary. And the issue of refugees as well, we are going very soon to vote on uh, the resolution who contains uh, the Global Compact on Refugees as well. And I think civil society organizations have a very, very strong role to play in the um, defense, in the uh, defending uh, the rights of migrants and of people on the move uh, in general. So that, that was also very important. We will share also, if you're interested, a series of activities that we plan to undertake. The big issue happening, of course, is uh, the Marrakesh conference on the 10th and 11th uh, of, of March. Before closing, just a quick note. Uh, what did I say? Uh, everything is in March, not true. It's 10th and 11th of December. And, and just, uh, I, I always, uh, because sometimes we take this for granted. Thank you for allowing my team to sit in the first row here. This is my team. And two, four, six, eight. Eight members of my team and only two men. The rest are all women. All women. <laughs> So it, this is, of course, not by coincidence. Uh, our cabinet is almost like 70-30, um, 65% women and 35% and men. I think it was about time. So just with that note, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank once you. again, uh, Maher, and I'm ready for any questions. 
Th thank you. Thank you very much for these inspiring and, and I think well, well informative, uh, very informative uh, briefing. I think now you know the priorities which, with which you can start to also align your work that you do with the President of the General Assembly and, and her team. And looking forward, uh, just to expand on what you right, rightly said, the change of the name of the department isn't just in the name, because the way we see our role, public information is, can be seen as one way. Like, we are producing and you are consuming. But global communication, but we want to communicate. And we also want to communicate with, with all of you and to bring your voice into the United Nations as well. And this is one of the examples that we do. These briefings, these opportunities to meet with the President of the General Assembly and other officials. So now the chance is yours to uh, ask uh, questions. And, and please, let's, let's also, as, as we always uh, stress, let's try to give as many of you a chance to ask the question. So me, make your... Uh, intervention brief, introduce yourself, and the, those of you who are new to the microphone is just press, and then when it's read, then you can speak. So we'll, we'll start with three, and then we'll take another round. So one, two, three. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, welcome. Um, and we wish you the most success in the future. First of all, I'd just like to say Jerry Spivak, Communication Coordination for the United Nations. Uh, the thing that I'm concerned about, I just finished a book by Isabel Allende, uh, The House of the Spirits, and uh, this talked about power and how power can be misused or used and so on. And the question is, how can we, in an organization that supposedly involves the United Nations, deal with members that go against all principles of the United Nations and may have inordinate power to do so. So how can we censor them? How can we stop them when, for example, they say the Paris Agreement is, is the wrong agreement or uh, that they're about to end nuclear treaties with uh, Russia? So uh, this is a major concern, and I'm wondering how the General Assembly can deal with that. Please. No se Hola, Presidenta María Fernanda. Yo soy Douglas Castro de Nicaragua, de la Alianza Cívica. Mi pregunta es que hay problemas, por ejemplo, soy yo. Sí. Hay problemas, por ejemplo, como en el caso de Nicaragua, se está hablando de los refugiados, se habla de 40.000 refugiados y hay un problema humanitario, 325 asesinados eh, documentados por la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. También tenemos 600 presos políticos y creo que es una emergencia latinoamericana pero muchas veces solo se habla del problema humanitario y no se ataca el problema estructural, que es la naturaleza del régimen político en Nicaragua, que es efectivamente autoritario. ¿Cuál sería su respuesta a esos problemas? ¿Cómo atacar el problema de raíz y no solo estar atacando realmente lo superficial, pues, que son, que son sus efectos? Muchas gracias. Can you, wait, wait, can you wait until it turns red? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much for speaking of us. I really appreciated what you said about being the moral conscious of your country. I'm part of Nicaraguan civil society, and as you know, in Nicaragua, since April, the state-sponsored violence has led to 500 political prisoners, 300 extrajudicial killings. Right now, people in Nicaragua are living in fear of being unjustly imprisoned, tortured, and violated by the very authorities that are supposed to protect us. States are the guarantors of human rights, but in Nicaragua, it is a government who is violating our rights, who is terrorizing the streets, who is burning families alive, who is killing to shoot its own citizens. Right now, the 600 political prisoners are being tortured, women are being raped in prison, they're being starved, men are being sodomized by guns. It's a terrible situation, and as a, a political leader, as the as a president of the General Assembly, will you condemn these human rights violations and will you work with the member states to secure political will to demand the immediate release of these political prisoners? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take more questions? And, and yeah. Or I, I think you, a couple more. A couple more, okay. okay so give, uh, more. One. Two, three. Okay, I'll come to you. Yeah. 
My name is Margaret O'Dwyer, Company of the Daughters of Charity. Um, our constituents continually ask us, what is the UN doing about Venezuela? Uh, that would be one question. And then also a separate question, how does homelessness figure into your agenda? It affects women, it affects persons with disabilities, people without meaningful work, and a comment about how we can, how can we put an end to homelessness? Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Rosalie Nubinas, and I'm with the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is United States. I'm also a member of the Youth Representative Steering Committee for DPI. So my question in regards to restructuring and to reform, what are your plans for involving the youth in a way that's natural, honest, and our comments are upheld to the same seriousness as our peers? Thank you. Jeff. Thank you very much. My name is Jeffrey Huffines. I'm UN representative for Civicus World Alliance for Citizen Participation. And Madam President, uh, I would like to thank you for focusing our attention on the critical theme of making the UN relevant to all people. We would agree that the robust participation of we the people through robust NGO participation at the UN is critical to make the UN indeed relevant. And there are two matters of urgent concern to civil society. First is regarding the question of civil society participation in the General Assembly high-level plenary meeting on the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders that's scheduled for the 18th of December. We would appreciate knowing if civil society will be given the opportunity to participate in this event, both from the floor as well as on the panels, as it has been invited to do so in previous events such as last year's high-level debate marking the 10th anniversary of the International Convention on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. Second is regarding the urgent priority of revitalizing the UN, and we thank you very much for highlighting this. UN 2020 has initiated a sign-on letter addressed to you to urge you to be begin preparing now for the 75th anniversary of the UN in 2020. And all the preparations for high-level events during 2019 is most urgent. As this milestone approaches of the 75th anniversary, there's a widely shared concern that the sustainability of a rules-based international order cannot be taken for granted, that multilateralism is indeed under increasing threat. So we would therefore urge you to work with member states to initiate as soon as possible a formalized General Assembly resolution to mandate a process for a dedicated 75th anniversary summit for the UN in 2020. Thank you. Okay, I think maybe. More? Give me a chance to, to respond to a little yeah. bit of that. Let's. Um, okay, um, the question about power. I think it's so important because we tend to, to think that a power is monolithic power, that power is about heads of, of state and government deciding everything on behalf of their citizens. And of course, you know, the, the best system that we have, it is not a perfect system, but it's democracy. And, and I think, and, and believe me, I have been, you know, a public official uh, in positions where I was able to take some important decisions, but at the end, you, you, you end up understanding that power as, is a collective, truly, is a collective making. In that if you leave the people taking decision up there just to forget that whatever they do, they have to be accountable to the people that have voted for them or selected them. So I think that we should not take for granted, you know, people's power, the we the peoples of the charter, as our colleague was reminding us. In this house, the United Nations is in a way uh, the house of, uh, a house for rethinking power in a way that uh, I don't see any other places. For example, when I sit at the General Assembly, and of course now I sit at the podium because I'm the president, but I've been sitting, you know, in, in the Ecuador's 
place for for several times, uh, being a minister or, or an ambassador here as well. Uh, it is the only place in planet Earth where we all sit in the same seats. You know, I haven't seen, you know, seat of a country bigger or smaller or, or, or larger than other. We have all the same seats, the same microphone to speak and the same button to vote. And this is extremely powerful. That's why I'm a strong believer on multilateralism. That's why I'm a strong believer on the role of the United Nations. Of course, an enhanced role, uh, um, a, a greater presence of the United Nations. And also, something very important. I think that we all need to read the Charter again, because we tend to forget why we are here. In that, of course, it's uh, in just uh, as, as, as a very important note. A couple, two or three weeks ago, I sent a letter to all member states with a small copy of the Charter. And I invited them to reread the principles of the Charter. I think they are so powerful and they are so timely nowadays. Of course, the history has changed. Of course, after 73 years, we are not in the same situation as after the Second World War, but the principles have to remain the same. Human dignity, for example. Human dignity. It is so important, yet we see that human dignity is not respected in so many parts of the world, and we need to do more and urgently. Regarding the two colleagues that spoke about um, uh, Nicaragua, but also there was a reference to Venezuela. And, and here again, I want to be very honest with you. I, I am from Latin America. I'm a president that represents the region, but I, I am also the president of the 193 states. Uh, I, I follow closely what, what is happening in general in Latin America. Unfortunately and painfully, uh, issues are very difficult in several, several countries of the region. And the agenda of the General Assembly has to be dictated in a way by the member states. Uh, I think that if any demarche is, is taken, uh, the demarche has be, uh, should be taken by the member states requesting that the UN uh, you know, uh, looks at these uh, issues. What I know, because I have, you know, a very good um, co uh, conversation and permanent communication with the Secretary General, uh, he's also, as, as I am, trying to help and trying to be, uh, you know, to, to support these countries to engage into peaceful solutions of their own conflicts. Uh, international law is very clear about principles of non-intervention, but also about uh, principles of encouraged dialogue and peaceful solutions of conflict. If we want to see what happens when there is a military intervention, what happens uh, when um, the killings uh, of, of, of innocent civilians uh, risk can, cannot be stopped, then we have to look around and we will see more than one case. So I think that uh, Yes, uh, uh, perhaps the United Nations can be useful. Uh, the only way that the United Nations can be useful is using the mechanisms that exist within the system. The Secretary General and myself are both following the situation in these uh, two countries, and uh, we will be, you know, uh, ready to listen to the request or, the, or, or interest from the member states. General Assembly is the parliament of humanity, and whatever is decided there has to come from the agreement uh, of, of member states. And of course, we are concerned, uh, and the concern goes even beyond. The concern is making every region of the planet sustainable and peaceful. Unfortunately, we are seeing you know, some persistent conflicts around the world that are really, really affecting the fundamentals, starting by human dignity in so many parts of the world. Regarding um, the issue of homelessness uh, that you mentioned, uh, yes, of course, uh, 
uh, this issue is being, uh, has been addressed in many instruments and resolutions of the United Nations. Uh, more precisely and more importantly, the urban agenda, the UN Habitat urban agenda, that's from the multilateral perspective, but I think that homelessness is perhaps one of the most you know, painful and unjust symptoms that uh, we need to fight, fight against inequality and, and human rights. Uh, unfortunately, the places where you see these inequality gaps more acute are in urban settings. And I think that we have to uh, work towards reducing inequalities and combating poverty, which is at the center of the sustainable development uh, goals. Now about uh, the, the role of youth. I think that we have a Secretary General that has taken very seriously the role of youth. Uh, I was present myself last September when we launched um, the Youth Strategy 2030. Um, we have a special envoy on youth, uh, Jahadma. She, she is uh, an engine and a machine uh, of work herself. And, and I think that uh, basically uh, from my side as president of the General Assembly, I, I, I am ensuring and my team knows that that whatever, you know, any activity that we embark on, we need to have the voices. We, I don't like to speak uh, about youth. I want to speak with youth. And, uh, and so there is going to be anything that is connected to my, my uh, job is going to have a seat and a voice for the young people. My first activity in Katowice, as soon as I landed in, in Poland, was to join uh, the, uh, the COI, the Conference of the Youth, uh, with about 1,000 young people from the, around the world that are committed to the climate agenda. So you're very important actors of the multilateral system, but also uh, very important architects for uh, a, a more sustainable, uh, peaceful, and, 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 uh, and I would say, in bright world today. You know, I, I'm also not very keen about saying, no, no, you're the future. No, you're not the future. You're, you're the present. And we are working with you. Nothing about you without you. And uh, finally, on participation of NGOs on the 18th of December, on the 75th anniversary, we are working on that. Um, I, I want to be very honest. It, this is a very difficult issue. Uh, my role is to consult with all member states to come to agreement on the means of participation of civil society. If I could, I mean, my take on this, uh, having been a member of civil society, having been an activist myself, I know how important this is. Um, unfortunately, when the United Nations was created 73 years ago, or when the rules and procedures of the organization were designed, I think that we didn't have at the time uh, a civil society that was so vibrant, so active, and so important to the decision-making pro uh, processes. So we are working on that. Uh, I'm saying it's not an easy task, and we will try and make our best to have the, be the, the, the best, uh, you know, the best architecture, the best design for the 18th of December. We are consulting with member states. I have appointed two countries only to consult on creative ways to engage civil society. Uh, these are the ambassadors of, uh, of, of Italy and Argentina. And they are helping me put together a format that would, uh, you know, be uh, acceptable uh, to all interested parties. So I think that's it. On the UN 2020 75th anniversary? Oh, 75th anniversary, yes, indeed. Uh, we will start the preparations this year. I, I have already had some conversations with member states. This afternoon, I will meet the general committee, all the general assembly presidents and chairs of committees, and this is one of the issues that I, I am going to address with them. We, we are going to be prepared, and I hope that for the 75th anniversary, we will have uh, something good, strong, and big to share to the public opinion out there. Thank you. So next round, uh, so... I know that you two raised your hands before, so one, two, and then we'll come to this side, three, four, five, six. So, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nasser, Your Excellency. Um, my name is Monica Jahangir Choudhury, and I represent the international movement ATD 412, ATD standing for All Together in Dignity. 
At the UN, our mission is to create spaces for people living in extreme poverty to come and share their life experiences and their knowledge so they can input into UN processes. So we are delighted to, uh, to know about the theme on making the UN more transparent, more relevant, and willing to listen to the voices of the real people, and we hope that people living in extreme poverty are included in this process. Uh, we are currently trying to uh, launch a process with the president of ECOSOC to see how we can strengthen the voices of people living in poverty in UN processes, and we'll be delighted to explore similar uh, work with your office. Uh, my two questions for you are, uh, how can the GA encourage all member states to better integrate the voices and experiences of people living in extreme poverty in the national implementation of the 2030 Agenda? And are there ways in which people living in poverty can make their voices better heard within events organized by the GA? I'm thinking of um, maybe the HLPF that will take place in September next year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next, please. No? Ah, sorry, my first time using the microphone here. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for this chance to come before you and to meet you and speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. It's very refreshing to have a chance to be in such close contact and to really be, as you mentioned, more relevant and close with the United Nations. So we have a chance to come and represent an international organization called the International We Love You Foundation. And our chairwoman, Zangil Jha, has been leading a global movement at promoting UN SDGs on an unprecedented scale with around 150,000 volunteers inspiring millions. We have a theme to share a mother's love. Like as a mother continually gives and gives, so also we want to follow that example and give selflessly in many different fields. Uh, we currently participate in a clean world movement, worldwide blood drives, disaster relief, social welfare, international aid, including aiding refugees, especially in Jordan and Syria. So our question is, uh, what would you suggest to be the best way of encouraging and promoting female leadership in collaborating with the UN. How can the foundation work more closely with the UN? Uh, we're, currently under, uh, we're currently going through the process to work with the UN DPI and also with, with ECOSOC to do more correctly. Hi there, uh, Madam President. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. My name is Jonathan Cummins, and I'm the Partnership Manager for the World Human Accountability Organization. And it's a fairly new organization that works with um, increasing access to global health care, uh, climate change, and uh, promoting education and youth development. And we also do some philanthropy work. So my question is in regards to what you stated earlier about uh, reforming the Security Council. Could you specifically talk about what reforms you envision and how can NGOs and civil society uh, assist with reforming the Security Council? So what do you envision NGOs doing with that? Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful, uh, great opportunity, Her Excellency. And I really uh, applaud your uh, statement that J is the parliament of the humanity. But there is always a but. We are not there in terms of observer. Um, as far as I, I am aware, there are, I may be wrong with the number, uh, 5,000 NGOs, a combination of DPI, ECASAC, uh, Academic Impact, uh, UNESCO, UN Women, perhaps more than that. But we are not, A, not under one roof at the UN as the all the member states uh, under one roof at the GA, but we are not at the one roof uh, under the UN as an NGOs. So my uh, proposal is, or question is, what might be the best way to engage the NGOs, not just like with the ticket, whether we could get the ticket or we could, but in a formal mechanism that we will able uh, with the, all the uh, logistics and protocol as an observer uh, under one roof to be represented at the GA. And then the, most meetings are closed to the NGOs. So this is beyond my colleague Jeff's uh, 
question or a request uh, participating to the, uh, December 18, but how uh, can the UN relevant uh, if we are left out all, all or most part of the general assembly sessions as I consider we are as an all NGOs at large uh, public faces uh, as an NGOs and uh, universities, uh, if there will be any mechanism or any work to make real relevance starting at the UN here. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Hola, mucho gusto de conocerla. Mi nombre es Jennifer Macedo de la Escuela de Notre Dame of Maryland. Y como joven latinoamericana, quería preguntarle que, este, qué se haría en Ecuador para poder legalizar a las mujeres el derecho a, a voz de su propio cuerpo de, del aborto. Hello, Your Excellency. Um, um, earlier you mentioned about how the UN is pushing forth more of a conversation about climate change and trying to implement it into all, all NGOs and to um, all governments. My question is because recently more statistics have come out about how climate change is increasing and more governments are talking about how they um, are either backing out of Geneva or they're not just implementing basic rules about climate change. And because this is an issue that affects not just all of us in this room but the environment, and animals and just the whole reproduction of this world. Um, how are you pushing forth the conversation um, in the General Assembly with the member states to truly implement climate change in their governments? Thank you. I think I'm aware of the time and I think maybe this is the last uh, opportunity for you to respond to those questions and maybe we can continue a little bit after that as, lo as long as we have the room I'll, 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 and maybe talk about other issues if we have chance, but Madam President. On the question on how to engage and may participate uh, the uh, persons in extreme poverty and be uh, and give them voice. Uh, here I think that one of the beauties of the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 is precisely that is a tool that enables and allows uh, local communities to be to be fully engaged and participate. Very quickly, I visited India. Uh, one of the most touching moments when was when I had the opportunity to meet children uh, from Chant, uh, from shanty towns, very poor areas, that uh, they were uh, really uh, making. Uh, changes, profound changes in their communities, improving their livelihoods uh, using uh, the SDGs. And uh, I saw children of 10, 12 years old, uh, you know, uh, working at the community level with the SDGs. I think that um, sometimes, uh, really, uh, transformation of, 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 of uh, daily lives and livelihoods do happen at the very local level. And of course, the United Nations should be a space, should be a space to listen to them directly. But I am a full believer on uh, the principle of su subsidiarity. And I think that uh, the, uh, the, the SDGs allows that uh, to happen. Regarding all of the uh, um, engagement and participation of youth, uh, uh, the April HLPF and the uh, Youth Forum is going to be a great opportunity. I, we are working together with ECOSOC to make sure that we have, you know, a strong moment uh, to uh, put uh, the youth agenda uh, at the center. Same goes for the uh, summit in September, HLPF uh, General Assembly uh, Summit. Uh, engagement uh, with the UN, of course, there are means uh, very clear mechanisms. Perhaps they're not good enough. Uh, they have to be improved. They have to be uh, brought to present because, as mentioned, uh, 73 years ago, I think the composition of our societies was uh, very, very different. Uh, how to help on Security Council reform. Uh, this is one of the most complex yet and contentious issue in the House. Uh, very different positions, very uh, complicated uh, to reach uh, agreement on how and when to reform the Security Council, but there is a mandate of member states to go ahead with the reform. 
Um, Again, the, the question about how to formalize participation of uh, NGOs within uh, the uh, General Assembly. Uh, there are several ideas, several avenues, several, uh, several um, even uh, options on the table. This has to go through the hands of member states themselves, but you have a very important role to play there. What we have so far is the ECOSOC, uh, uh, accreditation process and mechanism and the NGO committee uh, within uh, the UN. And we will continue to work uh, under this uh, framework and of course uh, you have an ally on me so anything that I can do I'll be more than happy uh, to uh, support. Uh, climate change, uh, yes of course. Uh, we are running out of time for climate change. That was, I sent a very bold and strong message in Katowice two days, two days ago. Uh, the uh, evidence, scientific evidence is telling us and that we, if we do not act urgently, uh, seriously, I mean, and it is true, uh, humankind will disappear from planet Earth. And planet Earth uh, with humankind perhaps as well. So it's not to be tragic, but uh, evidence shows us that if we do not increase our ambition and change the way we produce and we consume, we are going to all disappear and faster as we were um, expecting. So we have to act quickly and now. And this is not only governments, it's the private sector, is organized civil society, is the consumer side as well. And finally, on uh, in Ecuador, the right to our bodies, uh, I think that uh, Ecuador perhaps is one of the countries that has done the most in terms of legislation, in terms of protecting the lives of, of women. Uh, but there is more to do. And I know that the issue of abortion is a very complex issue. If you look at what is happening around the world, uh, I think it's useless to give my personal opinion on this, but I think it's good and uh, that uh, women, especially young women, get involved in this discussion because uh, there is still a lot, a lot to do in terms of women's rights in particular, but uh, in terms of uh, women's survival and women's, uh, women's uh, right to their own bodies, of course. And there's uh, a long way to go still. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I, I, I know that you all want to ask questions, but I know that also the President has a schedule that she needs to keep to. So she has been very generous with her time to be with us today, and I would like to, on behalf of all of you, on behalf of the Department of Public Information, Please. I want to be very politically incorrect and uh, just not respect the order or anything, but I saw a young woman from my country, from Ecuador, you know, raising her hand since the very beginning, and if you allow me to, to listen to her, uh, she wanted to say something, and I'm eager to listen to her. She is so sorry about that. Please. Uh, Maria Fernanda, I feel uh, very blessed and grateful for uh, stay pr and present here. Yes, um, represent my wonderful country, Ecuador. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, I want to con uh, to say congratulations for be the first woman to to, uh, to represent the Latin America and also the pres of the uh, the first uh, woman to the General Assembly president. Um, I want to introduce myself, and my name is Nicole Insuasti. I, um, I, I am a member of the International Presentation Association, NGO, the, the, the IPA member of ECOSOC. Um, my focus work uh, was specific with indigenous people in Ecuador. I had the opportunity to have this um, wonderful time with the indigenous issues, especially, especially with the youth, uh, young people in, the, in Ecuador. And my question is uh, so specific, uh, how we can relate and promote the SDGs and the Agenda 2030 uh, for the countries in development, especially uh, Latin America. Uh, because um, we know that Latin America has a lot of problems uh, as a result of the corruption. So how we can uh, vinculate the Agenda 2030 and the multilateralism in this country that has the corruption? So w how we can reduce that and improve uh, to the inequality that is the big issues that the world have, has to promote uh, the 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 solution for a wonderful 
and work better for all. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Fernanda, to, for being present. Es un orgullo para mí que tú estés representando a mi país y aquí a Naciones Unidas. Gracias. Muchas gracias también. Very, very quickly on that, um, I have seen extraordinary examples of how uh, indigenous peoples, they can, they have done, and there are several cases in Ecuador, um, a couple of them, that they have taken the 2030 agenda and they have done a translation uh, exercise. Translation exercise meaning culturally adaptive um, uh, SDG framework. And this is extremely important. And they come, uh, have come up in the case of Ecuador that I don't better, and I've worked with indigenous peoples for decades now. Um, what they do is that uh, they um, come up with these um, proyectos de vida, life projects, as they call it. Uh, in Ecuador, we have uh, 15 indigenous nationalities, as we call them. And uh, several of them, they have gathered under their own government structures to translate the Agenda 2030 to be to to transform it into into a culturally sensitive 2030 agenda. So that is a great exercise. Uh, I think that's the way we 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 should go about it. Um, uh, and uh, especially using this international year of indigenous languages and especially um, also using uh, the decade of African descent. As uh, you know, in Latin America, in Ecuador, 7% of the Ecuadorian population is from African descent as well. So I think the translation can be done on the issue of corruption. I think we have to be very careful. Yes, uh, zero tolerance for corruption, zero impunity for corruption, but sometimes I think that the corruption agenda takes too much you know, of, of the concern and, and of the media. They like to make scandals of everything and sometimes to hide uh, things that are as important as that. And the, I'm saying this as a citizen. Sometimes, you know, people are dying of hunger, uh, they are decreasing taxes for the wealthiest, and suddenly, but everybody speaks about uh, corruption. And you say that when you have a front page on corruption issues, all the rest just disappears. And I think that we have to give space and place for every important matter. Corruption is one, but all issues of poverty, of inequality, of violence against women are equally important. So thank you very much. That was great. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. I hope this is not the last time because I would like to come as, as uh, frequently as I can to have uh, this conversation with you. It's a learning experience and also, uh, to, to say the truth, I feel at home. I feel one of you. So thank you very much. Thank, thank. Thank, thank you very much, and I think this uh, last statement is music to our hearts and to their hearts. We will make sure to come back to your office, definitely. And one of the things that we will also share are the uh, details of the conference that uh, is uh, 26 to 28 August of uh, 2019 in Salt Lake City. We hope to see you there. Oh, August, that's great. It's very likely that we'll attend. <laughs> Before you leave, <laughs> a reminder of next week on the 13th of December is the meeting to come and discuss the plans and preparation for the DPI or the conference next year in Salt Lake City. I will be able to share with you some of the details and impressions I had from my visit to uh, Salt Lake uh, last week. And on your way out, you don't, you might want not to miss. There are uh, new exhibits. One of them will be open tomorrow, marking the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 10th anniversary. Uh, the exhibit opening will be tomorrow, but the exhibit is already out there. There's uh, another exhibit on people on the move, another exhibit on the question of Palestine. So please enjoy. Thank you.